So oral glucose, very good drug. You guys can give it. We'll talk tons about it during diabetic emergencies. So carbohydrate, dose, 25 grams. Oral would be the wrap. Uh, again, most of the time on the, on the ambulance, this, this is a standing order. Probably if you guys work on a BLS ambulance, most all your, all your medications is going to be a standing order. You can give these medications without too much fear. Like I said, this is not going to be too much. You're going to do a D-stick anyway, so you'll know if you need to. We just bottle that water and everything we have. No blood sugar, you just take them. Yeah, they don't sell it in this form, but they sell it. You go back to, to the Walmart section and they sell oral uh, hypoglycemic medicine. So the aspirin tubes. would be oral too? Yes, aspirin would be oral as well. Oxygen, I don't think we have to talk about oxygen anymore. If we do, then you're way behind. Okay. Make sure, though, one thing about oxygen you can now get high. is, yeah, <laughs> don't get too high on the oxygen. But one thing about the oxygen is make sure that uh, in class, see the non rebreather, on your written exams, there's not really any. Thing for nasal cannula. I know that in practical application that you want to be able to discern do I need a nasal cannula or non rebreather? In class, non rebreather. Alright, just put non rebreather on them for the testing purposes. I think that will be the best thing. And we'll talk more about oxygen delivery and, and uh, everything during respiratory emergencies. One of my least favorite drugs, activated charcoal. Activated charcoal is like a briquette. It's, it's, uh, I think it's almost seriously a, someone ground up a briquette and put it in water. It's charcoal. It's a binding agent. What it happens is uh, activated charcoal when given, it's given for overdoses, either intentional overdoses or accidental oral overdoses. Like someone accidentally took too many pills or took too much of their medicine or intentionally took a lot of pills to try to hurt themselves, you could administer activated charcoal. Within about the first 30 minutes or so, so if it's been, a, let's say you get a call out, a uh, young girl broke up with her boyfriend, took a bunch of pills, and she did this two hours ago, this is not any good, or an hour ago, this is not any good. Those pills break down within, what, 20 minutes. So what this will do is it will bind those pill fragments together, all right, and then you, the patient just poops them out. Uh, the dose is 25 grams of activated charcoal. How you would administer this on the ambulance, if you ever did, uh, and most services don't carry it anymore because it expires. I've never given this drug pre-hospital. I've given it, given it some when I've worked in the hospital, in the ER, but never pre-hospital. Uh, just one thing that you have to remember about activated charcoal is it stains everything. So if I was to spill that on your shirt, it would stain it. You... There's not any tide in the world that's going to get it out. Stain your shoes, stain the seats, stain the bed, everything. The other problem with activated charcoal is you give it and you put it, you, you shake it up to mix it together, to mix all the charcoal and the water together, form a little slurry, a malt type thing, and you pour it in a cup and you have the patient drink it. Now, some patients that are used to Overdosing, they'll take that like a cocktail and go, can I have another? You know, they're used to it. Other patients who are not, they're drinking it, and the next thing you know, they're spitting it back out, or they try to swallow it and they throw it back up. So, in the hospital, if they're going to give activated charcoal, which they don't give much anymore, what they will do usually put a nasal gastric tube in, or an NG tube in their nose. 
feel, uh, pull this up in a large syringe and just push it through the nasal gastric tube and the patient can't taste it then. It's nasty uh, tasting. It stains absolutely everything. Most patients end up throwing up, so now you have a, you know, a patient throwing up, so now you have airway concerns. Uh, but it's given for uh, overdoses, 25 grams. What else about it? Oh, it's an exorbitant. It's the class of drug. Once it's given, though, it causes severe constipation. So all overdose patients, they stay in the hospital a couple of days anyway for evaluation. So they give this, and then they give this cool little uh, drug called Mag Citrate. And it's cool because you can buy it at CVS. And it comes in, a, looks like a 7-Up bottle, the old 7-Up bottles. But it is a very potent drug. Uh, uh-oh, hold a moment. Stool softener. So when they take this, they, then they drink the mag citrate, which is a lemon flavor, uh, and then some un unfortunate student has to monitor their poo for a couple days. Because when they go to the bathroom, they poo in like a little pin, uh, hat looking thing. It sits over the toilet, and because they want to take that to the lab and see if they can come up with any fragments. Uh, pill fragments out of it. So that's activated charcoal. So what's the side effect? Vomiting would be one side effect for sure. Uh, you have to, it's given oral, so a contraindication would be unresponsive patient. Now there's more out there. These are not, so look them up. The big one that we look at in respiratory emergencies in your testing uh, cycle, you're going to come across a drug that's a bronchodilator or an inhaler. They say that the uh, any asthma patient, you, you guys, have, anybody have asthma? So you take these uh, inhalers probably on a regular basis, right? Or at least when you run, you take the inhaler, you inhale it. Uh, on your test, it will say meter dose inhaler. Uh, either assist the patient with meter dose inhaler or use meter dose inhaler for the asthma. We're, we're, uh, we'll go over this a lot in res uh, the respiratory emergencies on Wednesday. But in the, on the ambulance, in, in your clinical time, you give a breathing treatment. You use uh, a nebulized treatment. You use the uh, Ventolin, the same medication that's in the inhaler. It's just in liquid form. You pour it in a nebulized mask, and then they will nebulize it. So you give a nebulized treatment. And we'll show you that this week sometime when they, uh, on Benlin, or albuterol, is what's in the uh, meter dose inhaler. So you have Benlin or albuterol on your test, you'll see it as a uh, meter dose inhaler, but out on the ambulance while you're doing your clinicals, you'll give a breathing treatment. And on Wednesday, we'll show you how to do this breathing treatment. Albuterol is a bronchodilator it dilates the bronchioles. It's used for bronchial spasms like in asthma or emphysema. It is a beta drug. Right. You might remember what a beta drug will do to you. A beta 1 drug. And then a beta 2. Huh? Right. Beta 1's for your heart. Beta 2's for your lungs. So what is this going to do? Beta 1 drug. You knew everything about nacho. What about this? And you take out beta 1. What does it do to your heart? Huh? 
opposite increase heart rate. Right. It will, albuterol will increase your heart rate. Like if I took some of albuterol now, even though I don't have asthma, it wouldn't do anything to me except open up my bronchioles, I could breathe better, I get a little jittery, and my heart rate would go up until that medicine is worn off. So what would be a contraindication to giving out butyrol? Tachycardia, right. Usually about a tachycardia of above 150. They don't be tachycardic anyway, but usually around a tachycardia of 150. You have to be very careful with the beta drug because it in, it's going to increase their heart rate. You increase their heart rate too much, what are you going to do? Let's say you increase their heart rate to 180. What are you doing? You're right. You're decreasing the filling time. All right? You're making their heart beat too fast. It's going to decrease filling time. We decrease filling time, what do we do? Exactly. Decreased cardiac output. Very important. We'll talk about that during cardiac emergencies. Right? You can't decrease that cardiac output. You decrease cardiac output to a point, what happens? Hmm? Well, you decrease it way, but what's the first thing that's going to happen? Which would lead to what? So you have cerebral hypoxia, now what's going to happen? You're right. Altered mental status. <laughs> so if you get an altered mental status, eventually, if you don't correct that, it's going to lead to cardiac arrest. It could lead to cardiac arrest. Hopefully you'll correct that before then. So the beta 1 surrounds the heart, beta 2 the lungs. So it's going to give some bronchodilation here. All right. So albuterol or venlin, it's inhaled inhalation is the route. Very quick onset because it reaches the, those pulmonary capillary beds very quickly and gets into the bloodstream. Uh, so it's going to work very quick. And it's given for asthma, emphysema, CHF, a lot of different ways that you can give albuterol. But we'll talk about the more later. The, the dose is like 2.5 milligrams. You will have to double check the dose, but I believe it's 2.5 milligrams. It's so small on here, geez. Yes. When you nebulize it, it's 2.5 milligrams. I don't know about the meter dose. You get one dose every time you squeeze the thing. Uh, this is the best way to give it, obviously because it's it's form of a gas, so it's going to absorb quicker and better than the powder. A lot of people who are having an asthma attack, they will, they're breathing so fast and they can't control their breathing, they hit their meter dose inhaler, and then they go, and they get back to the throat, and then they exhale uh, the, the powder back out. So this works very, this works much better. Most asthma patients, what they will do, they will try the meter dose inhaler several times before they even think about calling 911. So they're already somewhat tachycardic, but you still have to give them some albuterol, right? You have to open up those bronchioles. So concentrate more on the nebulized part of it, but remember for testing purposes, it's the meter dose inhaler. Oh, yeah, much better. So, asthma, emphysema, cognitive bronchitis, uh, increased heart rate, jitteredness, like we talked about, makes you very jittery. But I've, I've taken a, in, in a albuterol treatment, for like a congestion, we were real congested, so I've taken some, an updraft, and it sort of breaks all that stuff up as well. But it makes me too too jittery. I really don't like it that much. 
All right, now you're drugged. You've been trying to talk about all, all morning or all afternoon. Prescribed nitro. This is the way that you will see nitroglycerin given uh, on the testing side. It will say that you have a cardiac-related call and, the, and your answer choices will be call medical control and ask for medical control to assist the patient with their prescribed nitro. That's the way that that's going to come out on testing purposes. Most of the time on a BLS ambulance, it's a standing order. So you don't have to call medical control. But on, for this part here, you want to make sure that you call medical control. Nitroglycerin causes vasodilation. It dilates the coronary arteries. It actually dilates every artery. So you're going to get a decrease in blood pressure. The patient's going to get some type of headache. Uh, sometimes a very severe headache from it because it dilates the arteries in the in the head, which gives the, gives them the headache. Now, knowing that it dilates the arteries, what should you do before you give nitroglycerin? Yeah, always make sure they don't have an allergy, but. Check their blood pressure, right? Because they're going to have, if you know that this drug is going to decrease their blood pressure, that's one of the side effects, is decreasing in blood pressure. If you know that, then you need to check their blood pressure because it's contraindicated in to give if the systolic pressure is below 90 to 100. I'm not really sure what number your book uses. I think it uses 100. So if the, somebody look that up for me, would you, as a book? So if you have a systolic blood pressure below 100, you can't give this medication because it'll drop it to the point where the patient, they're too hypotensive. So after you give, before you give the medication, check their blood pressure, and after you give the medication, you can check their blood pressure. It comes in a variety of forms. I may not have the other form. I hear that needle in there. Uh, it comes in a spray, a pump spray or an aerosol spray. You will notice in the pump spray that's a different, this weird color, this sort of orange color. Uh, nitroglycerin is sensitive to light. So in motion. That's why it comes in here. It also comes in a very small tablet. I'll see if I can find those tablets, but they're, they're hard to hang on to. So when I administer it by the nitro with the tablet, I pour it in the lid. Put one tablet in the lid because it's very, very small. And... Uh, I just pour the, have them lift up their tongue because the route is sublingual under the tongue. Have them put the tip of their mouth on the roof of their mouth and then I'll put the nitro under their tongue and let it dissolve. Very fast absorption rate, okay? And then also it's very bitter tasting. And nitro has a, a, a smell to it as well with the spray. Because if you go and you, you spray this under their tongue, you push that, there's always that thing that anything come out. Like, I wonder if anything come out. So now that's the patient, did they taste it? Uh, usually, I know because they say, oh, that's, that tastes terrible. Right. So you want to make sure that it, uh, that it comes out. That's probably the only drawback of this. It's easier to administer, but sometimes you don't know if it comes out or not. And then it comes in the very small pill forms as well. Isn't there one like Oh, very good. Thank you. There's also a nitro patch that you can put on and nitro gel. You guys wouldn't carry that nitro paste. You wouldn't carry the paste. 
But you, there's a nacho paste, you can just, it looks like glue, you can just sort of squirt it on the skin and put a patch over it and it absorbs very slowly through the skin. And then there's a nacho patch that some people wear around that gives off so much nacho throughout the day. Thanks for reminding me of that. The other contraindications, except hypotension, would be the the erectile dysfunction drugs, the Viagra's and the Cialis and stuff. This causes a potentially dangerous drop in blood pressure. So you have to ask. Uh, in fact, there's been a study that some women are taking it as well now. I didn't. I didn't really read into it that much, but. Primarily men, I mean all age groups of, of men take this as well, by the way. So, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily think of someone young having a heart attack, but uh, Viagra is a, quite a abused drug out there. But you have to ask that. That's just not some information that, especially if you guys go on the call and you have this, you know, 60-year-old male patient having a potential heart attack, they may just not be all forthcoming. Oh, yeah, by the way, I take Viagra, you know. So make sure that you ask about that. Uh, do you take any Viagra or Cialis-type medication? Because what happens is it causes that dangerous drop in blood pressure, and sometimes it's rebound. So... Even with ALS, you're unable to get that blood pressure back up. So the, it's potentially very dangerous. What else about nitro? Sublingual? A dose? 0.4 milligrams? Sublingual is the route? Most of the time, yes. But that's you just, know. You, you don't really know. <laughs> you're, you're just guessing. But 0.4 milligrams, I think that's why they, a lot of doctors prefer the tablets because they know that they're getting 0.4 milligrams of nitro on the pump and the spray. You're not quite sure of it. Very fast onset. Make sure you check blood pressure before and after. You can give nitro up to three times every five minutes as long as you uh, continue to check the blood pressure. Questions on nitro? The next drug that we'll talk about in allergic reactions is the epi uh, auto injector. The epinephrine auto injector is giving, given for patients like allergic reactions to, uh, you know, peanuts, beads, whatever the allergic reaction is to. Does anybody have a, carry an auto injector? No? No allergies? So you can see that the, let me find my auto injector here. Okay. So, it comes in a container very similar to this. Epinephrine is also a beta drug. It's a beta 1 and beta 2 drug. It's in the same family, not the same class of drug as albuterol, but it's in the same family. Al uh, epinephrine, the class of drug, is a sympathomatic, no, sympathomatic, Sympathetic, I'll get it right here in a minute. The word's like this long. Sympathomedic drug. It mimics the sympathetic nervous system. So what is the, uh, the medic in the end of that, that suffix means to mimic. So if it mimics the sympathetic nervous system, what is one of the side effects? You're right again. Increased heart rate. 
Anytime we have a sympathetic response, we get an increase in heart rate. So you're going to, when you give epinephrine, you're going to have an increase in the heart rate. It's a beta-1 drug. The thing that you have to be very cautious with epinephrine is giving it to the elderly. And I mean elderly like 70 and above, because it can potentially cause them to have a heart attack. The dose for this, the adult dose is 0.3 milligrams, and it's given sub-cute. That's where we're going to do our orange injection class, where we'll learn how to give sub Q injections instead of the epinephrine epi auto injector. So what you take, you notice on the thigh, yeah, you got Santa Fe, can you help me out? Sure. So, when you give, that, the, the picture the person has on shorts, you can just stand there for me. But when you give the epinephrine, here, you want to make sure it's the right drug, which it is epinephrine, auto injector, injector, epi auto injector. No, I got real one. No. Don't wait. Do it to yourself. Alexis, it will kill you if you enjoy it, it will kill you. No, but you can take 0.3, someone her age could take 0.3 of epi with no problems. <laughs> what would it do? Cause it have a little bit of heart rate issues, a little jitteredness, okay? No, it's not. <laughs> Do it to yourself. Are you kidding? You want to, you see the size of that needle? It's huge. <laughs> oh, I will find you. you. You said you volunteered. You said the dive one or that one. I didn't volunteer. You told me to. Okay, so you take the... Oh, get you know, away from me. I already, hate you. I already hate you. Get away from me. <laughs> okay. Right. Oh my God. Jeez, I can't get any help here. No, do it to yourself. Okay, so you'd always want to take the epi auto injector, get under your thigh. You don't have to worry about the, the pants or anything. The needle is about this long, about two inches, and it'll go through it, and it's spring loaded. So it'll go right through the pants like this. Don't do it. Don't do it. No, please don't. No. It's not. Here. Manna, help us out. <laughs> Why are they so scared? Here. Don't do it to him. All right. <laughs> Ready? And then, of course, you give it to the thigh. Let's just do it to the thigh. Stand up. They you assist them with their epinephrine auto injector and in the thighs. <laughs> You'd hold it there for ten seconds, all right, and then remove it. Wait, was there really a needle on that? No. no. She's just tough. She's just I didn't charge you. I don't trust you at all. That's my last. I'm not gonna lie. Randy, I'm gonna freak out. You remember when you did it last year to Melvin? Yeah. <laughs> He liked to that cry three times. Yeah. <laughs> so we moved, we moved the cap, find the thigh, hit the thigh, hold it for 10 seconds, then it self-administers itself. The thing that you have to be very careful of when you're doing that in class is you don't pick up the real epinephrine like I did at first. You saw me walk back over there. <laughs> I picked up the real one. This is a real epinephrine auto injector. It is not a training device. Get away from me! <laughs> <laughs> Sissy. Yeah, I am. Thanks. So make sure when we got when you guys are practicing with these that you uh, you look on the things that's training device on it. Cause I went over there and got it and. I look and I'm like, wait, that's the real one. You want to make sure it's a training device. Because they're in the same uh, holders. Now, we're, we will learn about giving sub-Q injections. On the ambulance, they don't carry epinephrine auto-injectors because they're so expensive. Uh, they're over $100, and the, F, the drug in there, in the ampules, 33 cents. But that's the size of the needle. It's pretty lengthy. Careful looking. So the 
given for allergic reactions. So how do you know if injector functions push hard for injector functions? It, you know, because it is stick in your leg. You're, you go, ah, oh, that hurt. As long as it goes when it's working. Yeah. So, vasoconstrictor relaxes smooth muscles, relaxes the airway passages that we learn about, the airway constriction that we learn about in allergic reactions, but it will increase the heart rate and blood pressure as well. Can you give a question? Yeah. So what if your face can be like only when it has like big thighs? Like, is it... All right, so we look at it, each drug, generic name, trade name, make sure that that's part of your drug... Uh, Drug cards, you have Vinlin and Albuterol, Motrin, Ibuprofen. So you have the, the two different names. Don't worry about the chemical name. There's just a chemical equation. You need to know the indications, contraindications, the side effects, what's going to happen when I give that drug. What is the uh, unwanted side effects of that? See, we give nitro... Uh, ALS, why well, it's good nitro for hypertension. It's the first line drug to give someone for uh, symptomatic hypertension. So if they're dizzy, nauseated, chest pain, shortness of breath, and they're hypertensive, we can give them some nitro to drop their blood pressure, right? So we're using that side effect for a different purpose. Uh, but unwanted side effects, like with epinephrine, would be the increase in heart rate increase in blood pressure. So make sure that you have those down in your cards. Make sure that when you give the, the medication, because you have to be very, very certain that that's the right medication, you've got permission to give the medication, because once you give it, it's gone, right? It's not like you can draw it back out of the body. So you have to make sure that you're using good judgment skills, huh? and just don't give a medication just because you can. I know a lot of EMTs and paramedics that do that. They give a lot of medications just because they can. The patient may not necessarily need it 100%. They go ahead and give it because uh, I've given drugs. So, so use some good clinical judgment skills there when you give medication. Never withhold it, all right, but don't abuse it. So we've already talked about this offline medical direction. So you have offline medical control, like in the testing uh, scenarios, where you have to speak to the medical director. Online medical control, where you get standing orders. All right. So we look at this. Do I have make sure you have the right patient? Usually in EMS you only have one patient, so that's not a problem. But make sure that that's the right patient. Perhaps in the emergency room, make sure that you've got the right patient, that it's the timing's right, it's the right medication, you've got the right right dose drawn up, and that you're giving it in the right route. Always ask the patient if they're allergic to any medication, right? Part of the sample. Allergies to medication, so make sure they're not allergic. And then my thing I always do right before I give it is I ask them again, are you allergic to any medication? Because I've had morphine in the IV hub, getting ready to push the IV, and like, have you ever had any bad side effects from narcotics? He goes, oh, just morphine, I'm allergic to it. Great. I mean, the syringe was already in the IV getting ready to get this drug. And so I had to go a different route. When I asked him if he had allergies to medication, he told me no. So the, you always, just to be on the safe side, ask that again. Make sure that they don't have any medication allergies. We look at the different routes of administration. Obviously, an oral administration is going to be a slower route of absorption. Okay. Sublingual, under the tongue, very fast route of absorption. So that drug's going to absorb and 
is going to take effect very soon. Inhalation, very fast route. Breathe it in, it's in the lungs, gets in those capillary beds, boom, into the bloodstream. So very fast. And then intravenous or injection into the veins is a very fast rate of an absorption. The other two, I think it's on the next slide. Let me just go ahead. Intramuscular or IM injection, not so fast. It gets in the muscle, has to absorb into the muscle. It's a slower but longer lasting onset. So it's going to take longer for the medicine to work, but it's going to last longer. Subcutaneous or in the fat, the cutaneous, subcutaneous tissues, the fat, that's where we're going to learn to give our sub-Q injections and, uh, with epinephrine, and it's rather slow uh, for being a shot. So it's not as slow as oral, but it's, it's somewhat slow, just due to some things that we'll learn, uh, like in the uh, allergic reaction chapter. Intraosseous into the bone. It's, it is very fast, but not as fast as intravenous. Right? And then endotracheal, where you have an endotracheal tube in and you spray, or you, you squirt the medication down the endotracheal tube. They're really getting away from this. Uh, primarily, the reason that you would give a drug endotracheal is for the fact that you couldn't get an IV. But they're getting away from that because most systems are using easy IOs now. Intraosseous is IO. It's a little drill, and they just drill it in there. It's very quick. So I'll show you a video on it later because you'll see these on the hamlets. Pharmacodynamics is just the way that just a big word for the way that the medicine works. All medicine is weight-based. doesn't matter what medicine that you're taking. Ibuprofen is weight-based. If you look it up in, a, in a, uh, a medication textbook, it will say so many milligrams per kilogram. All medicines are given that. They just sort of give a range of medicine to us. But make sure that you... In, especially in pediatric patients, all pediatric medications are milligrams per kilogram. I had some students come back, not recently, but they came back a year or so ago and told me, hey, we had to know that pediatric dose of uh, activated charcoal. So in your doses, make sure that you are adult and pediatric dose in both of those on your drug cards. Here with some age considerations, remember the elderly and geriatric patients, metabolism slows down and a lot of the drugs are metabolized by the liver so you have to reduce the dosage because the liver won't metabolize it as fast. Pediatric doses sometimes are a little higher because they metabolize very quickly. So after you give a medication, make sure that you reassess, make sure that you document the time that you give the medication, the amount that you give it, and any changes that the medication caused, good or bad. So time, dose, in changes. Make sure that you document that. And when you go out to people's houses, they're going to be taking a, a bunch of different medicines. Way too many to remember. That's why I have a drug book I carry around with me all the time. So if I need to know about this medicine that this patient's taking, either I'll ask the patient, hey, what's this medicine here for? Or look it up in the book. But there's some medications that you need to be somewhat familiar with. Lasix, like Lasix is a diuretic for CHF patients. Advair, asthma patient, 
Uh, you have several different hypertension medicines that are out there. Uh, this is one thing about learning the class of drug. And a little bit, when you look at it, G-L-Y, Gly, anytime that you see this in a, in a medicine, it is usually a diabetic medicine. You may not know what it's exactly used for, but you know that that's a diabetic type medicine. So you look at the sometimes the some prefixes and suffixes and maybe even the root of the word and separate some of those out and and you can figure out what the medicine is used for. If not, just look it up. They look Granny's trying to tell them what that medicine's for. When you get into a lot of different things, this is where you're going to have to, again, look this up. Google's your friend on a lot of these uh, herbal type medicines. A lot of people take this stuff. Right? So you've got to be sort of familiar with, with what it is because it's not in the standard drug book. I would just, everybody has smartphones and computers now. Even on the ambulance, if you don't have one, you have a, most services have computers that are, you can get on the internet and look these medicines up. If, if you don't have that, then you'll be like me in old school and I carry around a book with me. So if I need to look this up, I can look these uh, herbal medications up. Because a lot of times they will cause different, different side effects might cause tachycardia. So, I don't know if this is the case, but let's say they're taking, oh, this Gincopa, blah, 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 whatever that is, right? I know that that is good for memory. At uh, one point in time, they, this doctor uh, talked me into taking that stuff to increase my memory, and uh, it gave me such a horrible headache, I couldn't take it. And I didn't know if it really worked or not. Still couldn't remember where I hit the Easter eggs. Uh, get it? Never mind. Not that funny. But, so you got to look at those medications and say, hey, you know, are they doing it? They're taking this herbal medication. Is that going to cause a problem with me giving them out some epinephrine or albuterol? So it's good to just know the basic ones. Any questions there on that? Oh, quick overview. Everybody good? Right, one thing that you're going to do on the ambulance is assist them with IV, not starting the IVs. I'm going to teach you guys how to start IVs, but you can't start IVs. You're going to assist them on setting the IV up. So when you do that, because they start IVs on a number of people for a number of different reasons. Traditionally, they just start IVs for fluid administration or medication administration. A lot of ALS units start IVs just to have sort of a precaution. They have it there. Either they're hang an IV bag or they'll do what's called a, a saline lock. And it's just a, a small, y'all probably seen these in the hospital, just a real small tubing that's coming out of the IV. There's no fluid coming out, correct? Uh, that's my favorite thing to do. I start more saline locks than uh, IVs. If I'm not, get, don't give fluid administration, then I won't start an IV. I mean, this type of IV with the bag and the line, I'll start a, a saline lock. So let's look at this. Let's look at the bag. Let's say you, the, you get on the ambulance and they want you to help them spike an IV bag. So what you look at here is you take the IV bag out, figure out how to open it. You want to look at it. It's just salt water. It's isotonic fluid or normal saline. Right? Can you help me now? Wait there. Wait there. On that, just be an IV pump, do that. There we go. So you look at it, make sure it's clear, make sure it's in date, December uh, 2010, that's close enough. Okay? Yeah, but come on. Then you take your IV tubing out, 
and you have 10 drops or 60 drop sets, and all that means is that the drop set is that in every cc it takes 60 drops or it takes 10 drops to make one cc. This is, happens to be a 60 drop set, that's what I pulled out. Most of the IV sets are 10 drops. All right. So you, you take the tubing out, and this little wheel stop here allows you to stop the flow of the IV and, and open it. <clears throat> then you take this syringe full of medication. Oh, oh my. I have a headache. Huh? I have a Who? Hmm. Oh, I was. That was just a misfire. I was aiming back there. So you take the IV tubing out. You close it off. Close the wheel stop off there so fluid can't flow out. It's, the term is called spiking the bag. Any questions on why they call it spiking the bag? <laughs> this plastic spike will go through your thumb. Let me tell you. I've had it stuck in my thumb many a time. You're you're going down the road and you're trying to spike the bag and you miss and you come on this, the side of this tubing you come out of the tubing like that and I've had it stuck in my thumb before mm -hmm. and it really hurts mm -hmm. and it bleeds so I have to put another glove over the top so I take the IV tubing oh, one here is an injection port that you can draw fluid out the other one here is where you would spike the bag. So you take the, the IV tubing in there, and then you sort of just have to twist it up in there. Okay, see, it's then squeeze the chamber a couple times to about halfway full. Now, does everybody see that air that's in there? You've got to bleed off that air. You can't have that air. So you bleed off the air, you open it up, and then let the IV fluid start running out here. <laughs> not coming out. Hang on. Hold it up. My arm can only go up so high. <laughs> I'm not two feet tall. Well, I don't trust you, Mark. Then you just let the fluid come out, see? And then once the fluid starts coming out, okay. you just stop <laughs> the IV. You, this thumb wheel here, you just shut down the IV there. Now the IV is, is ready. I've bled it, got all the air out, all right? and now it's ready for the, put this on the back side of the the IV. So if I squeeze this, it'll come out? No, I've got it shut off here. Yeah, but only to a point. It's not going to... Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, it will till that chamber fills up. You feel like the chamber's too hard? Yeah, killing me. Killing me. Everybody good with the IV? Fairly simple. Did y'all do that last year? No, you showed it to us. You didn't realize Okay. So make like we said, make sure that you start the uh, fluid. Make sure the fluid's clear. Spike the bag, and then adjust it there. You can uh, close it off when you spike the bag. Then uh, this wheel here allows you to adjust the flow, and then you're then you're set. When, when you have the IV there, it could start backing up. Blood could start backing up into the tubing. So then you would have to check. Something's wrong. You may have forgot to take the tourniquet off. Maybe the blood pressure cuff is, uh, the electronic blood pressure cuff is on. And it could cause some backup in, into there. Uh, like it says there, it could have got pinched. The tubing could have got pinched under the backboard or something. So you would just have to start troubleshooting it.
And then when you start looking at it, make sure that the line is... Uh, when you do move patients that have an IV, you want to make sure that you're aware of where this line is, correct? That way you don't pull, pull the IV out. And then adjust the flow rate with just that wheel moving it up and down. Probably where you guys won't get involved. Infiltration is where the site of the IV is. So if you start, if they start the IV in the hand, and all of a sudden you start getting this big old golf ball looking thing on the top of the hand, that IV is infiltrated. That means the IV catheter has went through the vein. It's not in the vein anymore, and that fluid is going into the interstitial spaces. So that, that IV has uh, infiltrated. You guys have no, no questions? Everybody good on the intro medication? Yeah, you just stop it. Once you saw it infiltrate, you would just stop the IV flow. And it would just come out by itself. No, you'd, uh, they'd take it out and, and bandage it.